Uh, if you weren't here last week, uh, you may want to go back and look at that sermon because last week you should have left feeling encouraged and comforted. Uh, this week, you will not feel that way <laughs> if the Spirit's doing anything in your heart. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. There's a story about D.L. Moody, the 19th century evangelist. Uh, and D.L. Moody had always had a passion for evangelism. Uh, and at one point, uh, he started attending a prestigious church in Chicago, Illinois. And on Sunday mornings, he would go out into the street and he would gather as many kids as he could and he would bring them in to Sunday school so that they could hear the gospel. The elders of that church were not as enthusiastic about evangelism as Moody was, nor did they approve of his method. Sometime after attending this church for a while, Moody appeared before the board of elders and asked to become a member. They deliberated for a little while and then asked him, Mr. Moody, did you pray about the decision to join our church? Moody replied, no, sirs. Well then, Mr. Moody, we think it would be sh you, that you should take some time to pray about this decision and ask the Lord if he really wants you to join our church. And so he did, and they thought that that was the last that they had heard of Dwight Moody. However, a couple of months later, Moody again appeared before the board. Quite surprised to see him again, they asked, well, Mr. Moody, did you pray about your decision to join our church? Yes, sirs. And did the Lord tell you you should join our church? Yes, sirs, he did. And he told, the, he told them, uh, he told me that you shouldn't feel bad about it either. He's been trying to get into this church himself the past 25 years. <laughs> Yikes. But imagine... As you think about that, for a moment, Jesus coming to you and telling you that he's not a part of your church. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to look at one of the seven churches in Revelation to which Jesus quite literally has nothing good to say about them. And what, I, what I've hoped, if you weren't here last week, I talked about one of my, a couple of my goals, my prayers for this, this week and last, uh, was that God would open up our eyes to the spiritual realities, the cosmic realities, the war, and the fight that we find ourselves in every day, that we'd have our eyes open to that, and then we would get courage for the fight that we're in to engage in it. And my prayer this morning is that we would have our eyes opened if we think that we're okay with Jesus and we're actually not, that we would embrace this mindset, as uh, Pastor Matt Chandler writes in his book, The Overcomers, that Jesus won't be an add-on to your life. He is your life. And he's not the top of your priority list, but he's the page on which all of your priorities are written, that he would be the foundation of our lives, that he would be enough for us as we live our lives. So, as we read this particular portion to this particular church, I want you to, again, we kind of did this last week, I want you to imagine you're attending church, you're going to church, it's a beautiful day, you walk in, it's a nice church building, and you look outside the window, and you've got a beautiful view of the Lycus Valley, which is where Laodicea is located, you're feeling good, things are good, and you hear that there's a letter that's come to the churches, and it's from Jesus. And you get through, the, the pastor opens it up, reads it, you get through the other six churches, and then Jesus gets to you, and suddenly that good feeling that you had coming in vanishes as you realize the nature and tone that Jesus is taking with you. So let's read what Jesus has to say to this church. Starting in verse 14, the word of God to the church. To the angel in the church of Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. 
I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I've grown wealthy. I need nothing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, white garments so that you may be clothed and your shameful nakedness not exposed and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God, this morning as we open up your word, give us ears to hear. Reveal any blindness, any deception in us, any self-sufficiency that we may feel. God, remove it, cut it out of our hearts this morning that we may look like you and glorify you with the way that we live. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. See, Jesus comes to this church and they've got a serious problem. And that problem is self-sufficiency. He comes to this church with a strong warning and rebuke. They think they're okay and they think everything's fine, but they are in deep trouble and danger. And so he's coming to warn them and he reveals, he calls out the ways in which this self-sufficiency is fleshing itself out. One of the ways that it fleshed itself out for them was in their money. You see, Laodicea uh, was the wealthiest city uh, in their region, in the Phrygian region. They were known for their banking system and their deposit of gold that they had, a very wealthy city. And the problem was that the church, the people of God, the called out ones, looked exactly like the city around them. They said, we've become wealthy. We don't need anything. Another way that this self-sufficiency uh, played itself out was in their textiles. Laodicea was well known for the textiles that they produced, uh, including a black wool that would have been worn by social elites. So the church had apparently bought into this, that they had reached a certain status. They were comfortable. The city liked them. They had favor with other people. And so... They didn't need Jesus. Their medical care. Uh, Laodicea was well known uh, for their medical uh, innovation and a salve that they produced that was for the eyes and the ears for healing. They had a problem. They were self-sufficient. They didn't need Jesus. They had come to believe, we don't need anything. We're good. We're fine. Look at all these things that we have. Look at all the wealth that we have. Look at all the power that we have. Look at all the success that we have. We're fine. And here we see how incredibly deceptive the enemy of our souls is. He's okay with us succeeding. He's okay with us being successful and wealthy and having position and power. In fact, this is actually the thing that he's been doing for thousands of years, all the way back to the garden. What did he say to Adam and Eve? God knows that if you eat that fruit, you'll have the same knowledge as him. You know, the same thing as him. He doesn't want to share that with you. He's holding out with you, so just eat it, and you'll gain the world. And that's what he does. He comes and offers us the world. The only price we have to pay is our souls. This is what he did to our Savior. In his temptation in the wilderness, what did he say? He says, see the world, all of this, 
I'll stop fighting. I'll go home. It's all yours if you just bow. Just bow the knee. That's it. That's all it would take. This is what he's been doing for thousands of years. He offers us everything, success, fortune, power, wealth, all of it, good standing with other people. God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to have those things. This is how deceptive he is, and he's good at it. He masquerades as an angel of light. I, this, is, this is not in the text. This is, my, this is my hunch. I think sometimes the things that we attribute to God actually come from Satan himself because if we're comfortable and we're fine and we're wealthy, he knows that we don't need God. You go to the wealthiest parts of the world, they are the most godless parts of the world. So he's fine with Christians having success as long as we don't trust God, as long as we trust our own wealth and our own standing. And so what Jesus is going to do, he's going to call it out. He's going to take all of these things that they were trusting in, all of these things where they were finding their self-sufficiency, and he's going to answer it. And here's how he answers it. His solution to the problem is himself. I'm enough. What he says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy gold refined from me, refined by fire from me, gold that won't run out, gold that won't tarnish, gold that will never run dry, wealth that will never run dry. Buy gold from me. I counsel you to put on white garments that moths will never destroy, that will never be threadbare, that will never need to change again, that will cover your nakedness and your shame. Put my salve on your eyes so that you can actually see. You're trusting in this, but you need me. He comes in and he obliterates all of the things. The things that you're trusting in, he says to them, he, trusting in cannot be trusted. They're not where life is found. I'm the amen. I'm the faithful and true witness. I'm the originator of life. See, I want you, I want you to get a real sense of where this people were and where this city was. Uh, their self-sufficiency was to the extent that in, in 60 AD, so this, was, this letter is a few years after this event, but in 60 AD, uh, there was an earthquake that, that wrecked the Lycus Valley and caused significant damage in the city. And historians tell us that Laodicea refused help from Rome to rebuild because they didn't need it. Imagine that, a place devastated by natural disaster and say, ah, oh, we don't need FEMA. We don't need the Red Cross. We don't need Samaritan's Purse. We're good. It's how independently wealthy these people were. The irony of all the ironies, though, and this is what Jesus does. He's so, so good <laughs> at calling us out in our sin. Uh, they had a problem. Other than their self-sufficiency, they were so blinded by their self-sufficiency and indifference to what God had called his people to. Uh, they had, so there was a triangle city, set of triangle cities, a Colossae uh, and Hierapolis and Laodicea. And Laodicea had built, without the help of Rome, had built aqueducts from Colossae because they had, they had uh, cool, refreshing mountain spring water that they were known for. And Hierapolis, and you can go there today still, they had mineral bath, hot springs that were for healing. And so they had rigged up the aqueducts from these cities and it would come to the city. And by the time that the water got to the city, it was neither refreshing and cool and it had lost any healing properties that it had. And it was lukewarm. And oftentimes, they're told that visitors would come to the city, and if they didn't know the water situation in Laodicea, they would actually have a visceral reaction and spit the water out of their mouths. The irony of that is that for all of the wealth and the power that Laodicea had, they lacked the very basic necessity of water, and they couldn't see how dependent they actually were. And so Jesus says, you're... Your wealth cannot save you. Your science and medical advances cannot save you. Your power cannot save you. It's only me. I'm the one that you need to find your life in. I'm the source of everything. 
This, by the way, is how Laodicea ends up. You can go visit the ruins today. And this is just a fun, fun little tidbit. I'd nerd out on this stuff a little bit. Actually, these are pictures that I took. I was able to go to these places a number of years ago. Uh, Laodicea had not one, but two theaters. Most ancient cities only had one, but Laodicea were wealthy and powerful. Why not have two of them to put it on display? You can go visit the ruins of those, those theaters. It's one of the main streets you can walk down. And you can see how they ended up. So this morning, what I'd like for us to consider and what I'd like for us to, believe, or to, to think about and to pray about and ask the Holy Spirit to show us, if you're wealthy, here's what I'm not saying. If you, well, and we're in the West, so we are wealthy. It's the nature of it. Like compared to the rest of the world, we are, even if you don't feel it. Um, and even if you're not necessarily independently wealthy, um, if you have um, thoughts in your mind that money can make your problems go away, you're not in a much better spot than a person that's wealthy. And so what I want us to consider this morning, if you, if you have what the world would consider wealth and status, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're sinning. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get that out of the way. Um, but I want us to understand how insidious wealth is, because I know how insidious the prosperity gospel is in the West, and we're exporting it to other places in the world. If you don't know what that means, what I mean by that term, it's this idea that if I come to Jesus, if I follow Jesus, then wealth, health, and prosperity are mine. If I do the right things, if I go to church, if I study my Bible, if I check off this list, and I follow Jesus just like I'm supposed to, he's going to give me success. I'll have wealth, and everything will go okay for me until it doesn't. It shipwrecked so many people's faith because they didn't actually believe the gospel. They didn't actually believe in Jesus. And I imagine, we don't know, we don't know how Laodicea started. We don't know how that church was planted, but we can imagine that maybe it was Epaphras who, because Laodicea is actually mentioned in the, in the letter of Colossae, uh, to the church in Colossae. Uh, maybe it was Epaphras that started the church, and you can imagine that they start off very zealous, and they love the Lord, and they're being faithful, but over time the wealth kind of creeps in, the comfort sort of creeps in, the self-sufficiency until they no longer look different than the rest of the world and their trust is not in Jesus, it's in themselves. So I'm just asking us to consider this morning, maybe we think we're okay, but we're actually not. I can say with a a little bit of confidence, uh, thankfully here at Grace Church, I don't think Jesus would come to us in quite a scathing manner. Uh, we, we just had testimony of, of what we're doing because we do care about the mission that God has given us church. But that doesn't leave us off the hook because it's so easy to end up where Laodicea ends up. And I want to be honest about my own heart. This is, this is just, I know where my own heart goes. Uh, when our bank account gets comfortable, which is not often because I'm a pastor, but when, when it gets comfortable, I'm comfortable then I have peace. Then things are okay. As soon as things start to get tight, start to have to ask questions. How, how, I don't know how things are going to work at the end of this month. How this is going to play out. It reveals where my heart really lies in those moments. It's not trusting in the one who's always provided. And I always feel silly every single time that I don't trust him. And we don't trust him to provide because he's never not. Whether that's an abundance or exactly what we needed. Uh, and so I just know that's where my heart goes. I'm naturally inclined to want to trust in wealth. I'm naturally inclined to want to trust in position and power and find my sufficiency in myself. I'm just asking us to be willing as a church and as individuals this morning to not presume that you're okay because that's the most dangerous spot that you could possibly be given what Jesus says to us. So the question then should come to our minds. How do we make sure that we don't end up here? How do we make sure that we don't end up in this same place? Well, thankfully, Jesus gives us that. He gives us an answer to those things. The first thing that we need to do, the first thing that we have to do is receive his correction. Receive his correction. Notice what he says to these people. 
Those I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent. I, like, I want us to have this picture of God in our minds. Um, not of a God who's angry with us when we sin, who's disappointed in us when we mess up, and who's, who's just unwilling and sort of forgives us because he's supposed to do that and has to do that. I, I want us to have this picture of God in our minds. Not of how some people presume, you know, the God of the Bible, man, that guy is just angry, and he's a monster, and he's an egomaniac, and all of these things. Don't talk about he flooded the whole world at one time. Well, yeah, also he gave people 100 years to repent. Look what he did to the Canaanites. Yeah, he gave them 400 years to repent. Hear this. When God comes to you and me, when he comes to the church, calls out sin in us and calls out self-sufficiency in particular and calls out our sins, he's doing it because he's a father who loves his children too much to leave them in their sin. That, that's what's going on here. And so he corrects this church. You say, hey, look, look, you think you're okay, but you're actually not. I love you. So I'm going to rebuke you and I'm going to correct you Come back. Come back to me. We've got we've to receive his correction. And I want to make a note here. Self-sufficiency is a human and American idea. It is not the mark of a mature Christian. It's just not. As we grow in Christ and, and as we learn of him and we get closer to him, our dependency should be more on him. And, and, and we should be more dependent on the people that he's placed us among. Not on ourselves. Not on our own strength and wisdom and wit. Now, self-sufficiency is a lie from Satan. The idea of the self-made man, the idea that I can just pull myself up by my bootstraps and I can accomplish it my own is a farce. And Satan loves when we believe it because then we don't need God. So we receive his correction when he comes to us and understand that it's the correction of a father who loves his children. The second thing that we need to do in this letter, it's incredible. It just gets better and better as you read it. Um, accept his invitation. So what you should begin to feel here is a very Old Testament feel with this letter, right? Where he just, God just lays in to his people. He's calling out any number of sins and ways that they're rebelling against him and ways that they're not trusting in him and they're worshiping false gods and he's just letting them have it. Like that's, you imagine God coming to your church and saying, you repulse me. You sicken me, and you're useless to me. That's what's happening here. Because they needed this. Because they were so deceived and so blind, and they thought they were okay, and they're not. Here's what's going to happen if you don't repent. I'm going to spit you up out of my mouth. But, but here's what God, here's, hear the heart of God. This is what he always does. You read through any of the Old Testament letters, you read through in, in the New Testament, he's the same God, he's consistent in how he operates, he calls us out of our sin, and he calls out our sin, he always comes back with the invitation for repentance. Have you read the story of Hosea and Gomer? If you have not, whew, you better. There's no clearer picture of the gospel in, in sort of one book that, that you can read where Hosea, the prophet Hosea, God tells him to marry a, a prostitute. Uh, kids, you can go ask your parents about that when you get home. And he marries her and she leaves him and he has to go buy her back, his own wife. And God said, this is like my love for my people. And then he just lays into him for like 10 chapters. And then he gets to chapter 14. He says, I'll give you my love freely. Come back. Or Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. You know that passage where we, we love it. It's a good passage. Come to me, all who are weary, and I'll give you rest. In Matthew, he just got done laying into the cities where he did his miracles. And he said, woe to you. If the miracles that I did had been done to you in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented, but you have not. Woe to you. And he says, 
all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Or in Matthew chapter 23, the religious leaders, they, they get done asking him a series of, of dumb questions, and he silences them, and when he has the room to speak, woe to you blind guides, woe to you, you den of vipers, you, you whitewashed tombs. And he gets to the end of that, and he's looking at Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I long to gather you under my wings like a mother hen to her chicks. This is the heart of God. And this is what we see in this church in Los Angeles. Look, look, you're, you're gone. You're gone off the rails. You're not following me. You're trusting yourself. But it's not too late. I'm right there at the door. We use this passage as a, as a passage for unbelievers, right? We, we'll apply this to everybody else except for the church. He's coming to the church. And two things should stand out about this for us. He's outside of the door of the church. He's not in it. And he says, anyone who opens that door, I'll come in and I'll dine with you and you'll dine with me. You'll find me to be enough. We accept that invitation. We receive his correction, accept that invitation, and then we get to walk. Like this just keeps getting better and better to the one who overcomes. Look at this in verse 21, to the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me at my throne. That's crazy. The God of the universe just said, if you overcome, if you'll repent of this, and you won't let wealth suck you in and the self-sufficiency and the indifference that you're sitting in right now, if you won't let that rule over you, but you conquer it, you overcome, you get to rule with me at my throne. And I'll remind you, the throne in Laodicea no longer exists. Human thrones have always risen and always fall, and they always will at the throne of God that endures forever. This is the nature of the gospel. God in his loving kindness does not and will not let us stay in our sin. And so we'll call it out, but the invitation is to always come in. Come back right here it is not too late. As long as I have not returned and as long as you're still breathing in your lungs, it is never, ever too late to repent of your sins. This is what Jesus was doing when he comes and he lives and then he dies and sheds his blood and rises again so that we could have life so that we could be welcomed into the kingdom of God. So he would walk in this coronation, because this isn't just a future event. This is right now, sons and daughters of God, of the Most High God. We walk as the royalty of God, and we take the kingdom of God to the nations. That's what he's called his church to do, and that's what exactly what Laodicea was not doing, because they had become self-sufficient. They'd become indifferent to the mission. I can almost hear them looking at the church in Smyrna and saying, man, what's wrong with these guys? Why don't they just work harder? Why don't they just get better jobs and then, and then they won't be poor? Why don't they just figure it out? Why don't they just maneuver like we have? And then they'll have favor with people and they won't face the same pressures. I can almost hear them saying it because they become indifferent and become self-sufficient. So we receive his correction, we accept the invitation, and we walk in our coronation. The invitation to sit at the throne to the one who overcomes. And I want us to hear this. Again, I'm just asking us to search our hearts because here there are some stats that I want to share with you that ought, absolutely ought to shock you and terrify you about the state of the Western church. And one is from a study from Barna. If these numbers are even close to being true, like it doesn't even have to be, like these might be extremely low. But even if it's even close to being true, one study that Barna did, and Barna, by the way, they're not, they're not enemies of the church. They're just, they're just people who are reporting on the state of the church. They're saying only 6% of Western Christians will share the gospel in their lifetime. I think we found the problem. Even if that's 10 even if that's 15% or 20%, 
We have failed to be obedient to the very most basic command that God has given his people to take the gospel to the nations. And I'm not saying it's all because of this one reason, but there's no doubt in my mind it's because we've become so self-sufficient and so independent. There are other studies that Barna has done that show more and more as the years go by, more and more Christians are saying and believing that the gospel and proclamation of it is optional in the Christian life. When was the last time that you wept for a friend or a family member or a coworker who's lost? When was the last time we wept the reality that there are billions of people in this world who not only have they heard the gospel and rejected it, they've never heard the name of Jesus. They don't have a church down the road that they can go and hear about it. They don't have a Bible in their language. They're lost and they're dying and they're spending eternity separated from Christ and we remain indifferent. I'm always blown away. In Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul and talking about his fellow Jews, brothers and sisters in the flesh. And he said, I'm in deep sorrow. My soul is in anguish because they were, they were the adopted, they're the adopted people of God. They received the covenants. They received the promises. The Christ came out of them. And they're lost. And I would trade my own soul, my own salvation, if it meant that they would come to faith in Christ. How rare is that among us that we're so utterly dependent in Christ? Utterly dependent upon Christ. That there's nothing that Satan could ever offer us and this world could ever offer us that's going to stop us from trusting him and taking the gospel to the places it needs to go. As I wrap up here, I want to say something this morning. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're here this morning and you have everyone fooled. You spent your life in church. You look nice. Things are okay. You're doing well in life. You've got all of us fooled. You cannot fool God. Jesus says, I know your deeds. And you can fool everybody else with your nice clothes and your nice bank account and your nice life. You're not fooling me. You are wretched, pitiful, and poor. The offer and the invitation stands. Repent and turn from your sin. Believe the gospel, the good news of the amen and the one who is faithful and trustworthy, the originator of life himself. May we never get over the gospel and our utter need, not just for the salvation of it, but the sustaining grace that comes through the good news of Jesus Christ. Where's the indifference in your heart, the self-reliance in your heart that needs to be put to death so that you can see? There's no space for a lukewarm faith in the kingdom of God. It repulses him. We don't have to fear this, though. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus always offers repentance to us. But this is the story of all of us. The story that we're living in is that God came to weak, helpless, needy people at just the right time. He came for us while we were helpless. While we were still in our sin, God demonstrates his love for us and that he would come and that he would die for us. If your heart is unmoved by that reality, there may be some things that God needs to do in you this, this morning. He's enough for you. He's enough to save you. He's enough to sustain you. Maybe you get everything that you ever hoped for. Maybe you don't. He's still enough. Maybe you get the job that you want. Maybe you don't. He's still enough. Maybe you're healthy and your family's healthy and things are good. Maybe not. He's still enough. Maybe your plans work out for your life. Maybe they don't. He's still enough. So because of this, we can overcome. 
because Jesus really is enough. Let's pray.